Hi guys, how you doing? Steve McKenzie here from the Pipe Shop and Little Havana Cigar Store. I'm here with Robert Caldwell from Caldwell Cigars and he's came to visit us. We're very lucky to have his presence as well. Shout out to uh, John Strange from Tor Imports for setting it up. We really appreciate you guys taking the time out to visit us. Robert, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. We're at a secret location, we'll not say where, but um, we're going to sample some of these cigars. So there's a new line called The King Is Dead, and uh, yeah, we're, we're going to have a look at them and we're going to ask Robert some questions as well. Um, so you are actually the you're the founder of this company? Yep. Yep, so um, that's, well, congratulations to Thank begin you. with. You know, we were saying earlier, the artwork's amazing, and Long Live The King, that's been a great great seller in our shop, you know, so it's good uh, in Scotland, you know, you've, you've got a far reach, so you're from Miami. Born and raised. Excellent, so uh, how easy is it to start a cigar company in Miami? It's very easy to start one, but to really? succeed I think is probably a yeah. bit more challenging. Mm. There's a lot of brands from existing companies or new companies that start every year, and then yeah. I don't, I don't think, you know, in the United States, because it's such a large market, I don't think it's hard to get a little bit of flash, yeah. but to maintain it and to actually build a company is very difficult. Yeah, yeah, because we've seen some, uh, I don't know if they're still going, but there's ones like that really stood out, like South Beach, and it was just a box, you know, it had like the neon pinks and stuff. Um, I can't remember if they were good cigars, if they were outstanding, I would have remembered, but it was more, it was more out there, you know what I mean? It was... Um, Miami colours and stuff, yeah. but some, a lot of cigar smokers, including myself, they prefer a sort of traditional, you know, if they're, uh, they know what they're buying, yeah. you know what I mean? So I think the packaging is very important, you know, you sometimes get it with products that everything's went into the packaging and then the products maybe doesn't live up to the, yeah. the look, but with your cigars, I'm, I'm happy to say the ones that I have smoked, they're, they're excellent and we sold hundreds, if not thousands of your cigars singly in the shop, we have the, the walk-in humidor and uh, yeah, I'll be honest with you, one of my best friends, uh, Pete Liddell, who's a big cigar smoker, um, that's one of his firm favourites and he smokes a lot more cigars than me and he tells me so the consistency is there as well, which is very important, you know, so well done on that one, Thank you. you know. Um, yeah, we've not, I've not been over to Miami to check out the cigar scene, but there's a, there's a long history there, isn't it? Because it's not far from Cuba, is it? No, very long history in Florida. Um, mm -hmm. Miami, I think, actually the first was Key West, mm. and then after that Tampa, and then Miami. Mm. But I mean, through the entire state, or all of South Florida, I guess, there's a very big cigar history and culture. Yeah, yeah. Is uh, Arturo Fuerte from, did he set up in Miami? Dominican Republic, but then they're based, well, their U.S. operations are through Tampa as well. Right, right. I sort of remember watching the, the documentary. Was he the first person to do the old Dominican cigar? And people thought it could not be done. You might know more than me about that. Actually. I, I'm, I'm just, sure. yeah, I'm just, it, this was a, it was a good day documentary on YouTube, but it was, it was an official yeah. one, you know, yeah, it was, a, if I see it, I'll send it to John and uh, I'll pass it on to you. I think the story is, his son was sent over to buy, to Cuba, to buy tobacco and there was something changing in the law, I don't know if it was the Kennedy signing the decree or something, but he had the opportunity to buy the tobacco and this was going to be the last one. So I think they bought so much tobacco, it, they basically had to remortgage the house. Got back to uh, America and then the dad went crazy to begin with, but it was probably the smartest move they ever made because nobody else... Uh, that point nobody else could get tobacco once it all ran out but they had shed loads full you know so but no it's an interesting documentary and like I said I'm sure he was the first to uh, do the all Dominican because people thought you couldn't do that before you know and he, he proved them wrong but your new cigar the king is dead that's all Dominican all Dominican yeah nice nice um, so have you been you been to Dominican Republic obviously I go every month really yeah. wow that was well cool. that's a cool job about eight times a year probably I, I avoid certain months mm. I avoid usually January well December sometimes I go in December but usually I avoid January and then August and September as well right. do they have extreme weather do they have monsoons or anything yeah I mean not any worse than my actually much better than Miami because right. like there's a mountain range that kind of drives most of the storms north so we get worse weather than they do. Right. But I mean, it's 
it's not enjoyable to be there at that time. Because yeah. in Santiago, where our factory is, it's also kind of high altitude. Right. It's like a 500 meter altitude, so you're, the altitude makes a little bit of a difference, but it's yeah. real hot. And it's just not nice to be there. Yeah, yeah, that humid, it's that tropical. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I've, been, I've been over to Florida, and it's, uh, if you're not used to it, that tropical heat, you're just like, <sighs> it's overpowering. It. Yeah, and they're a bit closer to the equator too, so the sun's more right. intense. See, we've got the humidity in Scotland, We've just look at the temperature. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it goes the other way here because it makes you colder than you would be without the humidity. Yeah, yeah. But no, I'd definitely love to get over to Dominican Republic. Actually, all the, you know, Nicaragua as well, and obviously Cuba. But it's all to do with the soil, isn't it? I yep. believe. So, uh, yeah, was it hard finding a farm that was. Uh, well, we don't, we don't grow any tobacco, we buy it all. Yep. Um, it's hard finding consistent suppliers, and particularly. I mean, we try to utilize very aged and then specialty or more exotic varietals of tobacco. So that was a bit challenging in the beginning. And then having consistent sources is also problematic because what happens now is you'll have a major buyer come in and just wipe out all of some of the yeah. supply. Yeah. And it's not just cigars. It's all like the blunt wrap industry has yep. grown so much. So tobacco, uh, the big time. What do they call it? Uh, uh, Fonta. Fonta. Yeah. Yeah, I was in New York and they were selling this cigar leaf yeah. under the counter. I think that's what they called it, Fonta. But um, that's not, that's a different culture from, yeah. you know. But uh, yeah, tobacco generally, I get this, you know, you get the impression, especially in the last six months, there is a big squeeze. There's certain um, businessmen that are just trying to buy as much tobacco as they can, you know, because it's, it's a resource. Yeah. You know, it's going to be like gold or like claret back in the back in the day it was so so valuable that yeah. you could trade with it you know but um scotland's quite anti-smoking in general you know we do uh, it's mainly roll-ups here people smoke cigarettes as well but we don't even sell cigarettes in our store you know we're a specialist tobacconist so uh, we sell the hand-rolled cigars machine-made cigars as well they are very popular but um hand-rolling tobacco and uh, pipes and uh, pipe tobacco as well but Brexit's played a part in availability. You know, we've definitely, we could get other cigars before and then it became hard to get. You know, you'd be hearing from your suppliers that there's, uh, the cigars are on their way, but they're stuck in Antwerp or something, you mm. know, somewhere in Europe. So uh, I just feel like we've sort of got over that because um, Tor and, and other companies have managed to supply, keep supplying new lines, which is great, you know, a decent price, but, um, Generally, when you go abroad, you feel like, Christ, how much are the cigars here? You know, you feel like we really pay through the nose. So you only, in the UK, if somebody's into cigars, you know, if they're an enthusiast like myself or even an aficionado, you know, they are paying the price for it. Yeah. Unless they're going abroad or they're getting upset, you know, but, you know, we, we can't do that. We can't, we can't send tobacco abroad and it's just, it's not worth it. You know, everything's within the UK, so that's our market. But it's good because uh, it seems that younger people are getting into cigars as well. Yeah, so yeah. in the US, I mean, we have tremendous growth, I think. Excellent. Early 20s. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. yeah. I, think, I think people in the UK are sort of catching on to that as well, you know. Especially down south, but a lot of the uni guys as well. The smoking cigarettes has become unpopular, which is, you know, like I say, it's a good thing. And these, uh, what are they called? Um, vapes, they're awful. You yeah. Know, oh, they're awful. Like I genuinely think that it's the guinea pig um, generation just now, and eventually they'll be more harmful. They'll find out they are more harmful I believe that. than rice. Well, yeah, no, I, I would say that definitely. So again, we don't sell vapes either. You know, and the amount of people that come in and say, "Have you got this? Have you got that?" And we, we say, "No, next door." You know, there's a Turkish supermarket. But at the same time, you have to. If we sell everything that everyone else sells, we're not as specialised, you know, so we do really appreciate um, companies like yourself that make the extra effort to make beautiful designs on the boxes and uh, that go with the prestige of the cigars. So this is the the King is Dead. Do you want to tell us a bit about this, sure. uh, Vitola? So, yeah, this is the Torpedo, we call it Last Payday. So this this blend, we, oh, this was our, it's new to the UK market, so we just launched it a couple of weeks ago, but this was one of our first Blends, we launched King is Dead, Eastern Standard, and Long Live the King together. Right. Just, just about 10 years ago. Yeah. 
And so this is a really unique blend because this is our only 100% Dominican cigar. Mm -hmm. And then we utilize a wrapper and then one of the filler leaves that's called Negrito. And those, that, that tobacco wasn't grown commercially since the 1950s. It didn't wow. burn well and it didn't blend well. Right. I fell in love with the aroma and the flavor of the tobacco, but it was yeah. very problematic to work with. So I actually, before we launched Cola, we spent about four or five years working with this blend. Um, and then finally, serendipitously, when we were working on the Caldwell brand, all of a sudden one day I had something that worked. Since we launched this brand, we had two other companies that came out with Negrito wrapped cigars, yes. but neither one could use it in the filler. Really? So we're still the only company that's managed to use it in the filler. Nice, congratulations. Um, thank you. And then this size, this is a 6x52 yeah. uh, torpedo. Perfect. It's got a little pointed head on it, but it's just a, it's a beautiful cigar. And I think on this blend, actually you have the two best sizes here. So. Yep. The Torpedo is the first one, and these little guys, the Manzanita, yeah. little shorties, this is an amazing cigar. And these, I smoke a lot of these because they, even though it's small, it looks like it's a 20-minute cigar, it's like a 45-minute cigar. Yeah. It's still a lot of tobacco. Yeah, and I, I don't know how it works, but this cigar just, it smokes slower, and you get a lot of money for your cigar on this little yeah. size. And I, I travel with this one because it's compact, it's small, but they just, they burn beautifully, and the, the flavor on... This one, that one, I mean, if I got, I'm a slow smoker, so like that's a two hour cigar for me. This one takes yeah. me about 45 minutes, but those are two of our, our those are the two best sizes on Excellent. this one. I might actually, on your recommendation, I might actually try one just now. I've, uh, I've not treated myself. We got them in last week and we're throwing an event next door. Oh, sorry. We're throwing an event at the Mother Superior pub on Leith Walk, which is just two doors down from our tobacconist on Saturday. So I'm really looking forward to that, and uh, I think the, the title, The King is Dead, raised a few eyebrows as well, especially in Scotland. Yeah, um, I, was I feel like it'll sell a little better here than... Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, John said that to me as well, and I think he's right. Um, but this one also caught my eye, the Anastasia. Can you uh, tell us a bit about this, because this is the third Anastasia release. That's the third saying. release. Um, so Anastasia is a blend we originally with, made with Ernesto Carrillo and the, the first one had a green label right. and then the second one had a blue label but to speak only about this one, this yellow label one, Anastasia from the beginning it's always been the very best cigar we could make as kind of a limited project mm -hmm. with the most rare and specialty tobaccos that were incredibly aged mm -hmm. available. So the first production was 70,000 cigars with a green label. The blue label was about 200,000 cigars. This one I think is right around 200,000 cigars as well. Mm -hmm. um, all Dominican tobacco, more rare varietals of tobacco than you'll find. We don't release the blend on that cigar because we're not- I noticed that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And we don't okay. do it. Well, the tobaccos that we're using for it, we're not spo necessarily supposed to have access to. Okay. And then, so we, we don't disclose the, the tobaccos on it, but it's a beautiful cigar. It's, Medium body, creamy, it's got kind of a real nice nutty undertone to it, a bit of sweetness. But that's my preferred size as well in that mm -hmm. brand, which mm -hmm. is Lancero. So it's a 7.5 by 38. And that cigar, I mean, we've been here for a week and a half doing doing visits and events. Yep. Everyone's dying for that cigar. Yeah, this is the one I think I'm going to choose on Saturday at the event. You know, uh, I know a lot of my, well, the guys I know that are coming, they'll go for the 52 gauge, you know, the Bellicoso, but... Yeah, I think I'm going to go for the Anastasia. It's intriguing the name as well. Yeah. So, well, we had a we had a Eastern Standard brand that we did a limited edition called Last Czar, and then we yep. utilized Czar Nicholas II as yep. kind of the icon for the brand, and yep. his daughter was Anastasia. Yeah. She yeah. didn't look like that. She was much more unfortunate looking than the woman <laughs> on the box. But we we said okay, we got to sell cigars here, so we'd make a yeah. more attractive version, and then so that was iterated as an extension on. The, the uh, Last Sar brand, they were part of like that yeah. collection in the beginning. And did that sell well, the Last Sar? Because that wasn't available in UK. Last Sar sold very well. Excellent. We discontinued that. We had a factory fire last year, mm -hmm. so we had to pick and choose. Right. And that cigar is much more complicated because the tobaccos that we use for it, we do additional fermentation and processing on the tobaccos, right. and they were already harder for us to obtain. And we mm -hmm. lost them all in the fire, so we unfortunately sure. had to kill that brand. I mean, what happens there, if you, even if you're insured, you, you can't, no, you're you can't get the tobacco yeah. back up, no? You're screwed. No. But when tobacco's in its raw form, it's, is it as valuable as when you've produced it, or is the markup, is it still quite expensive to buy it raw, you know? 
pre-making a cigar. Well, it's I mean it's it's considerably less expensive by weight, but tobacco once once you grow it, cure it, ferment it, then the longer the age that tobacco has gets tremendously more expensive. So if you're having a tobacco, you know, I don't know exactly what the number is, but it's like seven to fifteen percent per year compounded. So mm -hmm. if you get a tobacco that's five years old, it'll effectively cost 60, 70 percent more, or maybe even double what a tobacco that's maybe a year or two years old would cost. Right. And does it lose weight over time? Yeah, it will. Yeah. At, at a certain point, you're going to hit a wall and you're not going to lose much weight. But I yeah. mean, from from a year mark to a two year mark, you're going to you're going to lose a bit of, of weight via moisture, and you'll start to lose some of the oil right. over time as well. Yeah, but it'll just start to come out. Yeah. Yeah. And so, do you roll? Obviously, you're not not rolling yourself in the factory. But do you uh, do you take part sometimes? No way. No. Leave that to the experts. Yeah, right. Well, so what what do they call it? Is it trust trustadors? What do they call them? Torcel. Torcel. Right. Right. Yeah. And these guys, it's quite a prestigious job in the factory or in the country. Yeah, I'd say so. I mean, well, it depends also where you work. But a lot. Of, I mean, in Dominican Republic, the rollers take a lot of pride in what they do. A lot of pride in what they do. Good. Good. Uh, and I think when the people go over there, you know, just for a holiday. There's, it's very apparent that yes. it's a cigar country, you know. So how long has the Dominican Republic been uh, so involved in cigars? 20 years before Cuba started. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Little known fact, but Cuba was growing sugar mm -hmm. and DR started growing commercial tobacco. So the, the, the history is a little bit longer there. Nice. Well, I never knew that. No. That's, that's, that's interesting because everyone thinks Cuba cigars, obviously, and rum as well. But... Um, I think Cuba got hit, it's been hit with some unfortunate weather recently as well, you know. Um, oh, that's all it takes is a storm, yeah. you know, apparently. And because you've got the aging process, some stuff that's that's aged, if that gets wrecked, you can't, you can't do anything about it, you know. But no, I, I like a Cuban as well. Um, and Nicaraguan, do you, uh, do you have many Nicaraguan blends? We have a couple, they do very well, but I don't, I, I mean... I like our Dominican stuff much more yeah. than the Nicaraguan stuff. Is that what your heart is? Yeah. yeah. Really? And what's what's cool with Dominican Republic that you mentioned how long they've been commercially growing tobaccos. With that much history growing tobacco, you get different iterations, variations, and kind of varietals that'll form. So you have a farmer that's running a small farm, and then every year he grows his crop, does a seed selection, the best looking, healthiest plant, they'll take the seeds, and then that'll be what's used next year on the crop. Yeah. But then... That small farmer running that farm, continuously selecting the seed over the course of 100, 150 years, yeah. will turn into something that's much more unique. Yeah, yeah. And if you look at Central America, Honduras, Nicaragua, the history there is like 50, 60 years of this same occurrence. So in Dominican Republic, you have a much more broad spectrum uh -huh. of micro varietals or iterations of leaf than you have in other countries, which yeah. is really beautiful. And that's how... Like when we came out with Caldwell, we knew this and we wanted to focus on the more craft, smaller opportunity tobaccos that are available in the country. Right. So how does it actually work from seed? Plant the seed and then grow the tobacco and then does that give off more seeds? Yeah. Right. Or right. millions. Really? And, yeah. and is it selective? Obviously it's genetics with the seeds, isn't yeah. it? So you're, the guy knows, the guy or the woman knows knows what to look for in the seed when they're picking them? No, so what? it's the plant. So they just say, that's the plant. Yeah. So you'll have certain plants that are growing that are just outperforming the rest of the farm. Mm. So they're, they're bigger, they're stronger. Maybe they have better immunity to, to bugs because you have bug issues or, you know, hardier veins if you want heavier nicotine, things like that. So they'll right. find certain characteristics that they like about the plants. And then what they'll do is they'll put a bag on top of the flower. So when the flower yeah. opens, the seeds aren't lost. Yeah. And then they'll, that'll become a plant that's job is to just produce the seeds and then they'll yeah. take those seeds and those will be utilized the following year on the crop. And are they always female? Yes. Yeah. yeah. So that's a mother plant. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's interesting. So it's, it's quite a convoluted, complex process. Yeah. Yeah. Well, supposedly. Very rudimentary if you understand horticulture. Right. But to... I mean, this is nothing that I knew before I got into the industry in a deeper way, was yeah. understanding how it works, you know? Yeah, yeah. And so this is why if you look at tobaccos that are grown in Central America or Caribbean, 
you'll be in, I'm going to speak of dollars, but you're going to be between seven and let's say $30, $40 a pound top tier for wrapper being more expensive and then filler being the cheaper. If you have that same tobacco that's grown in the United States, yep. you can run up to like 150 a pound. And that's just the labor cost. Yeah. So, because it's so expensive to harvest the tobacco. Right. And to maintain the crop while it's growing. So the, the wrapper is more expensive than the filler? Wait. What, does the binder fit in there? Or is so binder binders considered? typically wrapper, right? it's Im imperfect. Okay. So a binder and a wrapper are both grown for wrapper, but then there's only so much tobacco that qualifies as wrapper. Mm. It's a structural reason and then also cosmetically. So a wrapper with a hole in it would become a binder. Yeah. Or a wrapper that's slightly torn would become a binder. Yeah. Because it doesn't have to have that perfection because obviously people buy it with their eyes. Yeah. So you want it to be blemish free, no holes, perfect, beautiful. And then additionally, you're going to want to have, when you're rolling the cigar, you want a certain amount of resistance and tautness to the leaf when you're when you're doing the rolling. So a wrapper could be torn, it could be utilized as binder. So it's not going to be wasted. Yeah. Yeah. But that's effectively the same purpose. And then that being said, there's certain varietals of plant that wouldn't be good for wrapper, yeah. but they're great for binder. So the leaf that you would use for wrapper on those plants, that is only going to come with binder. And that's not just a particular plant, but some varietals. Yeah. And then you have some very tricky, very intelligent guys that'll go do the hard work and they'll go through all that binder crop yeah. of a varietal that's never used for wrapper, and they'll find like five or six percent that then can be used for wrapper, and then you have something very special because well, it's unavailable in wrapper. Yeah, and is, it, is there much waste at all? Is there zero waste when it comes to next to none? Good. So even I mean, when you're stripping the plant apart, or you're 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 you know cutting the leaf to to make the cigar, all that scrap ends up being used uh, for usually short filler cigars, and then the stems usually are sold and then they're cooked down and they remove the flavor and the nicotine and then that goes into um homogenized tobacco product which is going to be a, like a like a slurry of paper and tobacco that's mixed that's used for machine made cigar yeah, binder yeah, yeah. or cigars like you'll find that have like kind of the paper well it's homogenized tobacco so it's that, that slurry and then they add this to it to give it more flavor and more nicotine we talk like swishers and stuff like exactly. that. And and those cigars, they're the ones that keep burning. If yep. you, yeah, yeah. It's the same with cigarettes as well. It's like if you you light one up, you put it in the ashtray, go and do something, you forget yeah. all about it, and then the cigar's gone. But we call them I don't know, I think you guys call them stogies or gas station cigars. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. But there's a there's a big difference between we call them King Edwards here, so we can't have swishers anymore because it's got the the word sweet in it. Mm. So in the UK, anything to do, anything edible, it had to be changed. That was about five or six years ago. So all the pipe tobaccos, you know, your walnut, walnut flake, is all had to be changed, you know. Um, but no, it's uh, King Edwards are the only release in, from Swisher Sweets available in the UK. But they've probably got the biggest name in the UK. You know, if everyone knows, not people that are into cigars, but Everyone just now and then, you know, a cigar, they'll get King Edwards or they'll get that for their dad because that's what was available, you know. But um, I think they were, they were made in the Dominican Republic and we couldn't get them for a few years just after Covid because, you know, the, the lockdown, um, they just, they weren't producing it, you know, they had to do the social distancing and all that, so, but they're back now, but to be honest with you, there's a big difference, there's a world of difference between a machine made cigar with the homogenized tobacco and then something like I'm smoking just now. Just like to say this is beautiful. Thank you. Um, yeah well thank you sort of like uh, thank you again for visiting us. Uh, like I say the the artwork's brilliant, the embossed, it makes all the difference. You know, I collect the bands after I smoke a cigar. So uh, I've got a few there, I've got my oh, I've got there, I've got my Cohiba and then I've got my Alec Bradley. This will probably go in there just now as it well. It matches too. Yeah, yeah. Color. No, it's good. It's good. It's um, no, it's a beautiful cigar and perfect size as well. Because people think they see the cigars all together and they see the smaller things and they think, oh, that's a totally thing. It's beautiful. Yeah. You know, I've been smoking this for what, fifteen minutes yep. already, so it's uh, no, it's definitely and it's a huge amount of nicotine. The thing with cigars that people don't realise in Scotland when they're just getting into it, you have to have the time mm -hmm. to smoke it because. 
it's nothing more unpleasant than rushing a cigar. Like it's it's the worst, you know. It's uh, you end up getting tongue bite or burning your mouth. And um, I was just saying to Robert how uh, well the cigar's going down. Beautiful cigar, and uh, like I was saying, it's uh, it's a good smoke as well. So if you're looking for a smoke, maybe twenty to forty minutes, go for the smaller version of the King is Dead. I'll get you to say the Vitola, the Man Manianza. Manzanita. 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 I'll tell you the story of the name. So we were in New York and there was a retailer and cigar brand but called Matt Sherman that no longer is it's iconic. Like, it's got the big cigar outside yep. like that yeah, yeah, I went past it in New York. And, and there was a guy that worked there named Barry who's awesome. And so he said you should make all your cigars, King is Dead Long with King Eastern Standard, in a little tiny 42 by 4 and call it the Little Apple. Yeah. Manzanita is what that means. Oh, wow. And make wow. it as a New York exclusive because yeah. the winners are shit. <laughs> and they have smoking bands and all the stuff like you guys have here yeah. so guys can enjoy a quick cigar. Yeah. I was like, that's a great idea. And then they kind of said that they would buy a lot of them, so we made a lot of them, yeah. and then they didn't buy any. Oh. So then we sold them to everybody, and then it became... Something that we sell a lot of. Does that happen a lot? Oh yeah. Welcome to the cigar industry. Oh, really? Yeah. Now we now we get a supply agreements signed. But that was the early days. We didn't know what we were yeah. doing yet. To be honest with you, on a much smaller scale, it happens to us in the shop as well. People say they'll go for something. You get in and you don't see them, you know. But um, if it's if it's a box of cigars, just take a deposit. You know. Yeah. So they'll definitely be back. But um, no, I went I went to New York 2018. Um, and we'd just taken over the, the tobacconist and I was keen, none of my friends smoked cigars, uh, well none of the guys I was there with and it was a lads trip but um, we'd done the whole uh, Brooklyn Hip Hop Festival and all that and I got friends over there but I was looking for cigar shops and I was looking for events to go to and it seemed to just be like it's tough. Yeah, yeah. Manhattan's very tough, you got to get it over to New Jersey, it's a lot easier. Right, well that's good to know. Um, but I couldn't even find a cigar store and the places that were online it was all like gentlemen's clubs and yeah. you know um, so I never bothered unfortunately but I did see the the big massive cigar outside yeah. of that Sherman store I my phone out and stuff you know but um, I saw a thing they were doing in some of the New York clubs where they do a competition you get the biggest see who can keep the ash on the cigar for the longest have you seen this? it's very 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 common right. competition that they're doing. I don't know why. Yeah, no, no. You know there's a hack though, I guarantee you, because I saw uh, it with the nuts yeah. and stuff. People just put a wire around yeah. it. <laughs> but you see when, the, when these guys are in their suits and stuff, massive cigars, but when it drops, it's like a like a nuclear winter or something, you know what I mean? But um, like you say, it's cigars to be enjoyed. Yeah. You know what I mean? Um, I say to people in the shop, it's the same with the pipes as well, there's no right or wrong answer you know don't listen to too many reviews because if you get s everyone's palate's different and if somebody slates a product maybe it's just not for them you get in pipe smoking especially because guys be smoking Latakia and uh, then they can't taste anything else yeah. so how are they going to give it a good review but more or less the only rule of thumb we tell customers potential customers is uh, don't smoke it too fast you know enjoy it but uh, where else in the, the US is worth going to for for cigars, good cigar scene? But Miami. I mean, Tampa's cool. Tampa's got yeah. really good retailers. Yeah. And they have a lot of history. Yep. And Tampa's got pretty decent food. And it's not that expensive. So I think that's a good city to visit. Um, and I think that's my whole list. Yeah. Do they vary in price from state to state? Yeah, no? big time. Yeah. Huge differences. Right, right. Or is it, is it Penn, Pennsylvania? Pennsylvania, Florida, and Texas are easy. Right. Everywhere else is kind of difficult. So Texas is actually good for cigars, yeah? Yeah. Texas has a one cent tobacco tax. <laughs> so they have it, but I mean, it's nothing. Right, right. And in New York, it's... New York's high. I don't know what it is because they change it every year. Yeah. But I mean, it's 30, 40% minimum. But there is, you can actually go and smoke inside in, in these places, in New York and stuff, or is it like London? Um, no, New York you can. There are cigar lounges, and they just have incredibly sophisticated uh, smoke ventilation systems, but incredibly, and then they have the exhaust on the top of the building. 
So yeah. like you'll go to Cigar Lounge, like Davidoff, Madison Avenue, all the smoke is exhausting 60 floors up. <laughs> so they had to run a pipe all the way up 60 floors to the building to exhaust on the roof yeah. so that nobody on the street level had to smell it. I love New York, yeah. honestly. I love, I love everything about New York, just the history as well, you know. But um, no, we'll definitely get back over there to the States and I'll take advantage of the, the prices, the, the one, one, ten, one dollar tax and stuff. But um, as far as Scotland goes, it's a wee bit more difficult to you know, have events and, and whatnot. Like I'm saying, on Saturday we'll be weather. Well, we'll be having the event anyway. I just hope it doesn't rain. You know, but they say in Scotland if you don't like the weather, just wait five minutes because it's going to change. You know, but um, yes, yeah, I've been to a few other events. We went to one there. Uh, Steve Johnston put one out and um, put an event on in Fife a few years ago at the you know, Robert the Bruce King. Yeah. Was, so it was one of his. Uh, Descendants and oh, it was an amazing event, you know. I think um, oh, I think there was there was a whole array of cigars, but it was also the whiskies as well, and even just the food as well, you know. And um, so it was well worth going to, you know. I mean, I always try and go to one of those events if if one pops up. I got invited to one in London last month. It was the the ambassador of Peru, but London's too far to go from here. Just just for another, yeah. you know what I mean. Um, but. England's a wee bit more smoker friendly because the smoking ban came into effect in 2006 in Scotland and uh, my, my father-in-law Alan Meyerthal, he was up at the Parliament, Scottish Parliament with the rest of the retailers and they were picketing trying to you know, get at least some allowances made for the specialists. Um, unfortunately that never happened, Scottish Government was, uh, they weren't having it but it was a year later that the cigar ban came into effect in England and Northern Ireland as well. So um, they had time to, to rally up all the guys, there's more retailers down there, you know, and some of the brainstormed and they managed to get a loophole where the specialists can have, you know, they can have a testing room, mm. which is genius, do you know what I mean? Um, I think they pay for it though, I think it's, it's not cheap, so if you go into a specialist and they have this, uh, this option, you know, it's a, it's a proper store. It's not not everywhere's got it, you know, not the sort of corner store. But it's a, it's a loophole, and when you go down to England, if you can smoke inside, it's it's a bonus, you know. But I don't think it's ever going to. I'd rather smoke outside in Scotland than indoors in England. Now. Right, well, that's a that's a good note. Yeah. So have you seen much of Scotland? Have you seen any of? No, that? I've only seen the cities and then what I've seen on the trains. But I enjoy myself much more here than I do. Yeah. Right yeah. No, that's that's great. That's good. well, honestly, it's it's great to have somebody of your experience, and uh, yeah, you've achieved a lot, man. Eh? You're uh, to have such a successful cigar company. You know, I was in the pub, and I said, you know, we've got Robert Caldwell there, and somebody overheard, and they said Caldwell, Caldwell cigars, you know, and then he's like, oh, I love Caldwell cigars. He was actually at the event. You were at yesterday. The Robert Graham event in Glasgow with the the whiskey and he's you know he's showing me the whiskey. He actually gave me some there, so I'll try that out. Um, I need to get a lift home off my wife. Feel like the car. I'll need to stay in Leith today. But um, no, it's good to. It must be a good, you know, good to know that you've put so much work into your brand, and you've stuck with it as well, you know. And then you've got worldwide. You know, you're renowned worldwide. I got amongst cigar smokers anyway, and that's the intention of this video as well, is to bring it to the forefront of what cigars we're actually smoking in the cigar scene, in the industry, but also in the Edinburgh cigar scene. So, uh, no, it's been an absolute pleasure to have you down at the shop and also uh, this uh, secret location, and you give us the, the skinny, the rundown on, on these new brands that you've got, on these new lines that you've got. So. What's uh, in the future for Caldwell? Have you have you got any? Are you sitting on any aged tobacco that are going to be? We have some special stuff planned for starting next year. So we had when we had the fire, we discontinued five brands, and then we have to kind of replace them, but we're not going to restart those brands. So we have a couple very cool ones that are coming next year. And sorry to go back to to one of the first questions. How easy is it? Um, like copyright and patent and um, patenting with uh, the brands 
with the names. You come up with the name. Is it, is it pretty easy to do? Yeah. Yep. Have you ever came up with a name and then find out later on that's already been done? Yeah. Yeah, I bet. But, but I've never, like, commercialized them. Right. So, but I've designed them and I had these great ideas. Or, yeah, I mean, you have really stupid stuff. So you'll do, you'll come up with a great concept and a name and then somebody has it trademarked in ashtrays. Yeah, I could imagine. And it's, it has nothing to do with cigars, but the U.S. considers, like, smokers' accessories yeah. to be a similar category to the actual cigar. So we've had that once or twice as well. Yeah, well, yeah, I know in the, I saw that, I was watching Entourage, I don't know if you saw that series, and that made me realise that, like, in Hollywood, somebody's got an idea, and a producer will buy it, not because they like it, but just because they don't like anyone else having that, yeah. they just bury it, you know what I mean? So, that the whole uh, legal side of it must be uh, not as fun as the actual smoking of the no. cigars and the blending and stuff, but, um, like I say, hats off to you. You've obviously, you've you've worked it out, man. Eh? Like you've managed to to have a successful brand in the world today. That's that's amazing, man. Especially at your age as well. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, we didn't know we were in the clear until our seventh year. Right. For seven years, we were white knuckling, hoping. Right. But then once you pass that, I feel like seven is the lucky number. Yep. And then and then we got past that, and then now it's it's smooth sailing. Excellent, excellent. And what's uh, your, your sort of core team? How many of you are there? Really three. Including yourself? Yeah. Wow. That's the, kind of the core. And then extending with, we have, we've got two more guys that are very important. Mm -hmm. But if they were kidnapped, we'd be okay. But then if, right. you kid, if you kidnapped one of the three of us, we'd be kind of screwed. Right, yeah. And is you, you're married? Yep. Is your wife involved in the company? No. She helps with social media. Nice. But not as a worker, just as, you know, it gives me more free time. Yeah. Well, the social media part's a huge part of it yep. as well, you know. Um, obviously, me and my wife run the tobacconist together. We are, uh, you know, we're, we're partners in the tobacconist. It was her parents, origin it was actually her grandparents originally, and then... Uh, we take over. We took over from our mum and dad. And our dad was a big cigar smoker. Um, Alan, shout out to Alan Meyerthal as well, who's uh, held down the the Leith tobacco scene and the cigar scene since the since the eighties. And uh, I, I enjoy speaking to Alan because he does experience that. Even some of the guys, the main figures in the industry in the UK now, Alan has more experience than them. He's been around longer and. Uh, you know, he might he might not a uh, might not throw it out there, but uh, it's a real real gem for knowledge, and it's good just to get an honest opinion of somebody. Because when you're in the industry as well, you sometimes people tell you something's good, but that's they work for them. Yeah. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? But uh, no, it's uh, it's a great industry to be in. You know, as a retailer anyway, uh, we won't make we probably won't make the um, the jump to distributor or even cigar. Uh, manufacturer. I was thinking about making pipes um, about three or four years ago. We got the opportunity, um, Keith and Lindsay took us over to Denmark and to France and I was thinking, you know, I've got the carpentry background, how hard could it be to make pipes? And then you go to the factory and you're like, there's no way I could do this, like, uh, you know. Um, again, it's, it's materials as well, so hopefully the Tobacco production continues, and uh, you guys managed to get continue to manage to get consistently good tobacco because you're doing a great job of uh, the actual final product. But and thank you for giving us a wee bit insight into what goes into from the start to the finish. I remember hearing, I think it was uh, it was Nicaragua, or Cuba, some of the cigars from seed to the actual cigar in the box. They'll only touch about eight or ten people's hands, you know, because um, it's family-run tobacconists, you know, it family-run farms, and then you know it's all everyone in the family, and then by the time it gets to the manufacturing stage, so it's not actually went through that many people's hands. Is that the case with you as well? No, I think the average is like eight. Right. Maybe right. Cuba's eight. Right. right. Yeah, I think it was Cuba. Yeah, and and this was some time ago as well. Um, I've not been over to Cuba yet, so I've still to so a lot of it's hearsay, you know. Yeah. But um, I need to do all the sort of South America, 
countries, all the places where cigars are, you know, prolific. I need to get my, I feel I need to, I, I owe it to, to the cigar culture to get myself over there and just, uh, you know, breathe, it's not, it's breathing the air as well, you know, the water, it's not just the cigar, it's also the environment, you know, the humidity and the warmth as well, you know, but, uh, no, I'm really, really looking forward to getting over Nicaragua and hopefully we'll get over to, uh, Dominican Republic as well. We'll give you a shout. Sounds you know what great. I mean? No, that's that's great. Um, is there anything else you would like to say to the to the audience? I like haggis. Yeah, excellent. My wife makes excellent fried haggis with oats. It's almost it's in burgers. It's beautiful. Um, but no, we've, I wish we got you some of the the famous steak pies from Baines and Son. Next next time you're here, we'll we'll make sure you be blown away by these pies. Like, Robert, I would just like to say thank you again for visiting us. It's been a real honour to have you here in our humble abode. You know, we don't get many visits from people in the industry, especially, you know, top of the line. I was, I was saying to John Stranger, what's the guy's name that's coming over? I thought it was just one of the rollers, you know, not just one of the rollers. I thought it was, would be privileged to meet one of the rollers, but then John was like, no, it's, it's the main man. So uh, it is a real, it's a real honour to have you here, like c cigars are, to be honest with you, it's the love for cigars that have kept us going in the tobacconist for the last, because we've had a rough five years, you know, just with the way the Scottish, uh, the Scottish laws are, and then we've had the tram works outside our shop, which are, it's great now it's finished, because you can get the tram straight from the airport, right down to your favourite tobacconist, which is, that's cool, it's, ah, it's direct, but um, it's been, it's been hard sort of slog, but for me, it's the cigars and, and just the cigar culture and it being a family business as well. It's kept us, so we've really, it's a real uh, labour of love for us. And, and you were saying the seven years, um, we still feel like we're maybe on the fourth or fifth year there. We will get there eventually. But if we keep going the way we're going and we keep investing in the cigar scene and you guys keep investing in us, then we will... Uh, yeah, you'll have a tobacconist in Leith for many, many years to come. And the tobacconist has been here since 1957. So to have someone like Robert Caldwell in amongst our midst at this time, and we've sold his cigars for years now, they've been very popular cigars, it is an absolute honour. Thank you very much, Robert. My pleasure, thank you. Cheers, and I hope you enjoy Scotland. I will. Great, great. Thanks, guys.